What up, my fellow dorks? It is the, the Turtle Dork here with another season. This isn't Game of Thrones. That's done. It's over. Damn. You've heard our re our reactions to season eight. And we've heard yours. Good. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> Damn. Even even this far removed from it. Like, you ain't came around on it and then like that? It's season eight now. I'm, I, I love the good? show. You good? I love the show, but I'm good. I, oh, okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm good. All right. But I'm, you know what, though? Like, the ride... The oh, journey, dude! I'm all like, like I still, it's still one of the greatest shows right. ever, regardless well, I, of. I'm how just that saying, season. not even just the show, but I mean, like oh, your but, experience oh, with oh, it, like going yeah. through it. So. Oh hell yeah! I, I'll never forget that man. That yeah. was awesome. So we're on a new journey now. So today is the launch of Disney Plus, yeah. and with that launch, uh, as everybody knows, is the first episode of The Mandalorian. So. We're, this is one of many hot takes that you'll probably see on the internet, but this is ours. This is Ed Ma, this is Turtle, this is Disco, and we're going to give you our thoughts on what we thought of this initial episode. Directed by Dave Filoni. Who that? Uh, <coughs> you don't know Dave Filoni? <laughs> oh my, from back in, hell no, I don't know Dave. Who the fuck is Dave? <laughs> you say like, you, what's his middle name? <laughs> uh, R. <laughs> Uh, um, he he's he's kind of shepherded a lot of the TV stuff in the animation realm. He's done so he's um he's kind of been the showrunner and kind of like uh the over kind of like the Kevin Feige of like the animated TV of Star Wars. So he like the Clone, Clone Wars, Wars stuff? Rebels, and he would directly studied under Lucas. So he if anyone knows the world like um. George Lucas, Dave. Fil a lot of people have said that they want Dave Filoni to be the Kevin Feige of the entire Star Wars universe, like how Kathleen Kennedy is the head of Lucas Films. A lot of people have been saying like Dave Filoni should take over for Kathleen Kennedy because you know she's been getting a lot of stuff because of how the movies, at least the Disney era of movies, have been. And because uh, Dave Filoni is so well loved and he studied under Lucas and what he's done in the animation realm of it, um, a lot of people think that he, sh they could see him taking over as head of Lucasfilm and really kind of spearheading like the canon of Star Wars. So that's who Dave Filoni is. If oh, anybody that wants, Dave Filoni. That Dave Filoni. Oh, okay. Yes. <clears throat> you talking about little Dave. Um, I'm talking about nah, Big Dave Filoni. He was little at some point. Oh, okay. <laughs> anyway. Oh, okay. Uh, Mandalorian, directed by Dave Filoni, that guy. Yeah. Um, starring Pedro Pascal. Will we see his face? Will we not see his face at some point this season? I, I don't know. Um, IG-11, voiced by Taika Waititi. We'll get into... This will be spoilers. We're going to get into spoilers. Mm. So, hopefully, we'll see him again. Maybe? Um, and your your boy, Avana. Avana Werner Herzog. <laughs> uh, we got uh, Carl Weathers, Creed. Yeah. And speaking of Creed, uh, the composer, Ludwig Gorenson, for whatever reason, was ex extremely inspired by um, the score that he brought in with Creed and Creed 2, because a lot of this score was very Rocky-esque. But let's get into the opening. Are you going to forget Nick Nolte? Nick Oh, that was Nick Nolte. I wasn't have spoken. It? The Ron Perlman looking big head motherfucker. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, because everybody kept talking. Okay. All right. Yeah, and Nick Nolte. <laughs> Nick Nolte. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my bad. My bad. I was thinking about the mugshot. That was great. Oh, okay. Yeah. Anyway. Um, but no, nah, man, let's get into the opening, man. Like I said, I, I thought the opening of this movie where he goes to the cantina fights these guys like the one guy was picked. I mean, it's very, it felt like a Western and people can uh, describe this show as being like a Western, like a Star Wars set in the Western and having that, that tone and those tropes. And it felt that way with this opening before you get to the title card. What you think of that opening sequence? Uh, I agree. I mean, I, the entire episode um, yeah. felt like a Western yeah. um, for that, for that matter. And, I mean, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. Uh, nah, I, I love it. It's, it's, it's pretty cool. I mean, like that opening, I, I feel like this entire episode, but specifically the opening, obviously they're trying to establish mm -hmm. a tone yeah. and a mood and, yeah. uh, and, and, and atmosphere. And they're trying to establish the type of person 
the an initial impression of uh, the Mandalorian, yeah. and um, yeah, I mean, I it, it's what I would assume. It's what you know that the tone that is set by that opening sequence is what I would assume if I just look at somebody dressed like that with that helmet, knowing what I know of Boba Fett, knowing what I know of the pedigree yeah. of like their lineage and stuff like that. So it, it's true that it doesn't betray <coughs> anything that one would assume uh, when looking at that character. And so I mean, it's it's a pretty cool opening. It was pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, I thought did. it was dope that that door cut that your boy in half. Yeah, because they didn't show that in the trailer. See, I don't. You say you didn't watch all the trailers, but you you've seen that that part before. I don't right? think so. So their very first teaser, if that part is in the teaser, I I don't. I so that, that very first teaser that came out, like I watched it on my phone and I saw like a like a few clips of it. And I was like, all right, I'm good. I'm, okay, I, I'm good. I'm sold on it. I can't remember because they they showed that because that was like one of the big selling points. That was like the trailer shot. Oh, um, that the dude. Yeah, the cut. dude. Like, cause they show, but they they cut from it until because the way you see it in the show, it like starts to like close up slow, and then it like snaps, and then it just snaps them in half. And yeah. So I was just like, okay, I wanted to see how that played out, cause in the trailer, it was just like, why the fuck is that door closing so slow? Like, oh, <laughs> oh, they not, don't show him getting. No, oh no, no, they just show. So I thought that was cool. Um. Yeah, man, and then like just the look of the film, like you go to the scene you where keep he calling takes it a film. I think that that's a well. That's what I want to talk about though, is because like that that scene where he takes the bounty to the ship and uh, his transport says like watch out for the ice, and oh. then his transport ends up getting fucking eaten by, eaten the, by dino, the dino walrus. Yeah, by the dino walrus under the ice. But that whole sequence, like it really does feel cinematic. The visual effects, everything from the opening, and then even what we'll get into later on, um, some of the action sequences, like it really does have that feel. Because that was my worry, like taking Star Wars and bringing it to the small screen. But it feels like they were able to really kind of uh, make that transition seamlessly. I mean, it still feels like a TV show. There are some, there are some moments where yeah. like the quality kind of like, but it's not I, for me. I don't think it's anything as so drastic as to, you know, damn the whole you yeah. know production. But it it, it is um, it is a compliment that you and even me thinking like, man, mm -hmm. this is it has a very cinematic quality to it. I think yeah. it's a compliment that you keep referring to it. Uh, subconsciously, yeah. as a as a as a movie and as a film, yeah. Um, so kudos to the production team for that. So we got the cast that we mentioned. So in the beginning, uh, let me get your thoughts on Carl Weathers and then your boy uh, Werner Herzog because it, it seems like those are you know uh, uh, the Mandalorian is bringing the bounty to Carl Weathers. So Carl Weathers is the guy that dishes out the bounties to him, gives yeah. him the missions, and uh, gives you your. He's the guy in the video game that gives you your quest, your side quest, or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> and the Mandalorian was like, I'll take all these side quests. Like, hey, he was like, give time. me all of them. Um, it's cool to see Carl Weathers. It is. Uh, it is. Uh, we don't get a lot about his character. Much can be implied if you come into it with a with a base knowledge of yeah. that type that type of character or yeah. the western or whatever that the guy that gives out the bounty you can kind of surmise a, a, a type of mm -hmm. uh, relationship between the two they're obviously um, very well acquainted with one another there is some type of history which yeah. more than likely you will be that. explored like as the show goes on but yeah. you know I mean as far as you know as far as him in that scene I thought it was fine I thought he did fine yeah um I don't know. I don't know that I like what he's doing, like with his voice, like who Carl Weathers. Like I felt like he was trying to like. Wait, like, you thought he was doing something with his voice? Like, like trying to put on like a like a like a rough, like a rough raspy, like hard. <laughs> like you, 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 you're, you're Dylan from Predator, dude. You, you, you don't have to do that, man. You could just use your regular voice. You're Action Jackson. That was that was, that was my, I just I just watched Hobbs and Shaw again, and the scene with Kevin Hart. Spoiler alert! If you haven't seen Hobbs and Shaw, oh, when he does his voice, when he does the voice on the plane, he's like, "Why are you talking like that?" It's like, "Stop doing." It. <laughs> yeah, he went to, you go to Apollo. You good, man? I, didn't, I I need to rewatch. I'm gonna rewatch the episode, but I didn't think he was putting on the voice. Maybe though. it was just me. I don't, know. I, don't, I don't know. I don't know, man. But let's get into your boy, because uh, when you came on screen, I know you're a big fan of. Oh, I lit up. Verna Hussle. I still think about Jack Reacher when he That's asked him to not... eat his eat his. When he's trying to eat his hand or something. Whenever I bite, see... bite his hand, <laughs> he, he, he his fingers off. Whenever I see him now, 
That's the first thing. I mean, granted, he has like an incredible like filmography. Yeah. He's an amazing director. And an actor as well. Like he's also awesome. He's a he's a crazy good narrator when it comes to like documentaries, yeah, documentaries and shit. Yeah. Um, but whenever I see him, the first thing that pops up is that scene in Jack Reacher. What, what are you willing to do to survive? <laughs> <laughs> That's I'll the never, coldest shit. Yeah, I'll ever. never forget it. That was That's one the coldest watching shit. that in the theater with you. Oh, you was there. Yeah, oh, I can't remember which theater, but we was in there, and it was that part came up with Jack Courtney who was in it. Um, no one thought that was funny, and no, and this, the theater was solid, and then you sitting right next to it, and you just bust out laughing. That shit was hilarious. That shit, <laughs> I, I'll never forget that. Anyway, him yeah. in this show, he adds like a. It's funny because like you don't see like because of the 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 lore of the, the Mandalorian, like, they don't mm-hmm. take their helmets off. So, you know, with Pedro Pascal and his character, yeah. he, he's going to... And, that, and I would, that, that might be one of my criticisms about this episode, is that because you don't see his face, and as at the very least right now, like, tonally, like, his like the way he speaks, he doesn't give much in the way of characterization. Okay, right? yeah. So, and that's cool because, you know, it's just... A, I, I consider this entire episode as um, like a tone setting piece, just to a, a tone establish. Yeah, yeah. Like this is what we're going yeah. for, type deal, yeah. right? And I and I expect like the rest of the series to expand on characterizations of the Mandalorian and everyone else. So yeah. I can give it a pass. But having said that, it's like when he comes on screen, when Werner Herzog comes on screen, just the way that he sounds, just yeah. his the the his line delivery, like the his his acting in that his, scene, the, like demeanor. he just adds a, a gravitas to it. He that, does, he's com- he commands he commands that scene. Yeah, um, and he's not a at the very least in this, and I was it's kind of shocked because uh, at the very least in as at this stage he doesn't come across as a bad guy. No, you know, uh, no. he seems to be like a good guy. He seems to be like on the the side of you know good for now, um, but. Even with that, like like I said, he just he I'm just glad to see him in anything. He needs to be in more things. But in this specific scene, he that yeah. was that's my that's my thing of note. He just adds a gravitas to it. So we got the we got the pedigree of Lucas Films and Disney's budget yeah. behind it and their, their the cinematography is, is 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 up to standard of like some films and stuff like that. And then you come in with like Werner Herzog with a performance that yeah. is just film le- cinematic cinema level. So yeah. he, ele- I think he just elevates you know something that's already of a high pedigree. So yeah. I appreciate yeah. seeing him. And it's interesting too because of where this mm-hmm. actually takes place within the canon of Star Wars because this is five years after Return of the Jedi. So this is yeah. when the Empire has fallen, um, and so you see like all these different uh, kind of factions of the Empire, like almost like these little. You know, cells of like uh, stormtroopers and, and remnants, everything. like because you mentioned the stormtroopers, just their yeah. visage, like how they look. They oh, look yeah. like you know they haven't had the support of an empire. <laughs> yeah, like, exactly, exactly. So that's pretty cool. Like the storytelling that's going on just visually, without exactly you know exactly. having to speak uh, about exposition or whatever. Yeah, so it definitely feels like it kind of has that underworld type of feel to it where you're dealing with a lot of people like shady people you don't really like you said there's no clear cut villain or protagonist or antagonist or anything like that it just feels like these are just people just trying to survive the fallout of this of the war exactly just people trying to live and survive in this world and we're seeing that story of these bounty hunters so I like that I like that I like the setting of that Um, I guess we can get into a little bit uh, you want to talk about Nick Nolte? I, th- honestly, I I was I don't want to say I wasn't impressed, but his character really just didn't stand out much. I guess it's more so just his voice acting, really. For me, like the big the big takeaway from that is you know that particular character. I mean, outside of just getting the Mandalorian from point A to point B in, yeah. the, in the in the story and the plot, <clears throat> I think the biggest sticking point to me or selling point to me is just you know just the artistry and the craftsmanship like that character yeah the way that he is um brought to life on screen is just a throwback to the practical filmmaking because i mean you know i joked and laughed because he has such a big head (laughs) and like a normal human-sized body but the reason being is the practicality in that the animatronics in that head so when he's speaking you know, you have the the animatronic mask moving, and and the 
the movement and the synchronization of the lips with what he's saying, also with the eyes and what he's being, uh, what's being expressed. Okay. Okay. I, I feel like it's it's of the highest caliber. So you know, at the end of the day, whether that character turns out to be integral to this uh, episode or beyond, um, at the very least, it was it's still nice to see, you know, them, it, you know. The, with the droid, um, when he goes, uh, there's a scene earlier where when he goes to see Werner Herzog, he they open the door. Oh, uh, you got the little the little yeah. two the little two legged droid, the yeah. little, like, big trash can or whatever. Yeah. Like all that stuff is a throwback to the the you know yeah, original, the original trilogy, trilogy and the practical effects. And so, yeah. uh, Nick Nolte's character for me is just an extension of that. Oh, absolutely, <clears throat> yeah. I mean, I I love the practicality, the puppetry work that's being done. Uh, like I said, it's definitely a throwback, and it's in line with where we are. Um, timeline wise um, after Return of the Jedi that you don't want it to be something where like a prequel effect where it takes place 30 years prior <clears throat> but you have all this like advanced New technology shiny. you know yeah. so yeah. it feels in line with where we're supposed to be within the canon so I like that and as far as like all these characters Nick Nolte's character Taika's character uh, Carl Weathers' character Werner Herzog's character yeah, because this show almost kind of like hits the ground running. Like you don't spend a lot of time establishing oh, yeah. who the Mandalorian is. He yeah. he's in the middle of getting a bounty, and then he jumps from that bounty to taking another job, and yeah. then he's off out off to the to the races. And so you have all these characters who are introducing uh, plot to him. Yeah. So we don't get to spend a lot of time with him. So it's really to me, I wouldn't. I'm not even at a place where I can feel comfortable to, comfortable to say, oh, this is how I feel about this particular character because I really don't know anything about any of them yet. Well, that's why I love, too, because this, <laughs> it, even as an introductory episode, the first episode, it's not bogged down with uh, exposition because this really does feel like a lived-in world and we're just kind of dropped right into the middle of it, even though we have the movies and all these other different references, but it's not... It's not. It's not. It's not. It's not worried about trying to explain where we are. It's just like, look, either if you know the canon, great. If not, then we'll get you caught or, up or, or catch up. Cause <laughs> or yeah, there's a bunch of like, uh, you know, uh, novelizations and stuff yeah, like that. And yeah, think that I'm. I'm pretty sure fill in a lot of the backstory of what's going on. And so I don't know. I wonder if like for some who aren't familiar with it, if it a lot of that stuff will be you know go over their heads, or yeah. if it'll feel daunting being thrown in the middle of this this world yeah. and not having a lot of it uh, put in context. Yeah, yeah. But with great storytelling, they'll they'll give you bits of information to kind of get people like like just understanding the history of the Mandalorian and that they'll, they'll, their race of people. You know, because Nick Nolte character uh, kind of mentioned that a little bit, so we know that there's a history of these people and that you see little flashbacks of. Um, I guess uh, Pedro Pascal's character as a kid because I guess there was some type of uh, uh, I guess during the war because um, they even mentioned that when the uh, the other Mandalorian was making his uh, shoulder shield oh, yeah. where you see a lot of that so they're giving you little bits of information here and there yeah. so you know and I like how they're doing that instead of just you know having this exposition dump of just having the character explain all this different stuff because you don't need that especially yeah. in this series that's going to be what eight episodes i think but let's get to the end so we get introduced to ig11 uh yeah. where they get where they go to i guess to like this little compound where they're going to get the asset that uh Werner Herzog again sent tipping on. its hat like heavily towards the western and just the yeah. setup of this yeah. particular showdown and also in the way that that was staged as well uh-huh so uh Taika Waititi I you know, I knew he was voicing IG-11 and then like so I was waiting to hear him speak and talk yeah he does a really good job of creating a fully different realized character with that droid because yeah. I was expecting to be like oh it's gonna be Taika Waititi you know what I'm saying which I, <laughs> for like five seconds I was disappointed but as that scene played on and by the time it was over and definitely, like now in retrospect, and hearing you talk about, it, like I'm, yeah. I'm glad that he was able to separate, like pull himself yeah. out of it, and just be a, a, a character. As much <clears throat> as I love Taika Waititi as a person, yeah, and his, not necessarily his shtick, but just his his mm -hmm. brand of comedy. Yeah. Like I, I like that he was able to dial it back a little bit and just 
be this character instead of himself. Yeah, um, and a great character. But it's still, it's still, uh, it's still funny. Like, it was, it, it was. Really I hilarious. mean, and and even just the aesthetic of not just the look. And the thing I like about it too is the fact that remember, in was it Empire where we see those bounty hunters, which yeah. I think we see them in this episode in that cantina. In cantina yeah. Um, and in IG eighty eight, I guess was was an Empire, but. I remember as a kid, you just like, oh man, look at these bounty hunters, and we actually now at least one of them we get to actually see them in action, yeah. which we've never seen any of these bounty hunters in action. Yeah. So it's almost like you know, like realizing like a childhood dream. Yeah, your kid that. fiction. Yeah, man. Yeah. <laughs> so I I thought that was cool too, and you kind of joke that when you see him walk, it kind of looks like what do you say a clumsy Terminator, <laughs> a, a goofy Terminator. Man, he just. Cause you know, like the T eight hundred, like he's just he's just really methodical in his movement. He's just shooting this yeah. shit, just dying. And he was doing, he was like a mix of the T eight hundred and uh, Dante from The Devil May Cry, even and, and shooting oh, behind his okay. head, and a mix of that and yeah. uh, Christian Bale and uh, Equal. Oh Rio. yeah, doing yeah. all this shit. So I thought that was really. I thought that was. Pretty yeah, cool. that that was cool, man. And then like another bit of comedy. Was the, the fact, you know, he's kicking ass, but all of a sudden he just wants to self destruct. He wanted to let that thing go. <laughs> he couldn't wait. <laughs> he couldn't wait. I thought that shit was funny too. Man, the Lord was just like, wait, wait, hold on, man. Hold like, on, man. just don't self destruct. Stop the countdown. Bro. He's like, dude brought out the cannon. He's like, oh, time to self destruct. Like, hey, dude, hold on, man. I got to, let me try something. Let me figure it out first. So I thought that was pretty funny. That, that was, was great. Funny. That was great. So um, they get to the asset, and um, now again talking about lore. Now I'm not that familiar with Star. I mean, even though I mean everybody, anybody could be a Star Wars fan, regardless of how much you know. But I'm not one of these diehard fans that deep dives into everything. But what I'm, what I was conjecturing was the fact that that could be the descendant or child of Yoda because Werner Herzog did say that uh, the asset was 50 years old. Now we know that uh, Yoda, his race of people live for hundreds of years. Cause I think Yoda was like 900 years old. And so that would make sense that if, if the asset was 50, it would still technically kind of be a baby. <laughs> so were you saying that's Yoda's kid? So Yoda smashing in his 800s? Maybe I don't know. I, I don't know how long they live. And look, I could be completely wrong on this, but I I don't know. And but that's the thing I like about it because now it's like we have kind of a cliffhanger going into episode two yeah. of okay, who is the what is this asset? Who is it? Is it related to Yoda? I was just like, assuming that maybe it would just be like of the same species. As yeah, Yoda. it could be too. It could be. And again, like I said, I'm not, I would have to, you know, do some research, watch some other videos or see what other people are saying. But at least from what I saw initially or my initial reaction, I was just like, oh shit, you know what I'm saying? So yeah. I, I don't know, but uh, it leaves us going into episode two with a lot of questions, which I like. And um, yeah, man, I guess any, any final thoughts on this episode? Looking forward to episode, we got two this week. Yeah. So episode two drops mm -hmm. on Friday. Um, and then it's going to be every Friday after that. Um, I think it, the season's going to wrap up at the end of December. So we're pretty much at the end of December, we're going to get a lot of Star Wars, Ride the Rise of Skywalker, and then the season finale of The Mandalorian. So it's going to be a lot of Star hmm. Wars, but I'm, I'm excited. I'm from, looking forward to it. Yeah. I, so. dug, I dug the first episode. I'm, at, the, at the very <clears throat> least, I'm curious to see where the story goes. Yeah, yeah. And we haven't seen your girl Gina Carano yet. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and she's going to be kicking. I, I, I got a good feeling she's going to be kicking ass, too. Ooh. So, uh, yeah, that's our initial thoughts and our review for The Mandalorian, episode one from season one, directed by Dave R. Fal I don't know if that's his middle initial. Yeah. <laughs> Dave Filoni. Big Dave Filoni. <laughs> so, remember to check out our other dorks at Mouth Dork. At Disco Dork, at the WB Dash, at Sidewalk Siren. I am the Turtle Dork. Go ahead and check out our website, in the mouth of darkness.com, and all of our podcasts that we have. You can find them on the website, you can find them on Podbeam, on iTunes, everywhere. Podcast, a podcast. <laughs> Did I say that right? You know you didn't say po that right. Podcast can be found. <laughs> 
<laughs> anyway, with that, we're out.